Thank you for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and um, let a few more people join us and then we'll get started in just about a minute. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today uh, for our Lab Day online session. We are very pleased and honored that you decided to join us. Um, today we're going to, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Daniel Spagnoli. Um, he received his DDS from West Virginia School of Dentistry and his PhD from West Virginia School of Medicine. In 2012, he was the James Peltier Chairman of Oral and Maxiofacial Surgery and the Director of Dental School Hospital Affairs at the LSU Health Science Center School of Dentistry. During his time as the chair, he worked to grow the OMFS department's academic program and faculty, as well as develop new clinic and hospital relationships for the department. He's currently the owner of the Brunswick Oral and Maxiofacial Surgery. Um, and I could say so many awesome things about Dr. Spagnoli. He blows my mind every time we talk and I'm excited to have him doing this presentation. I'd also like to introduce to you Tyler Britt. Um, he has a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Pre-Med from Campbell University. He, is a surgical, he was a surgical assistant for Dr. Spagnoli for two years. And he's currently the co-owner and chief lab technician of um, their dental lab in-house for four years called Central Dental Lab. Now, Centric Dental Lab, sorry. So I could say a lot of very nice things about them, but I'm gonna go ahead and let them speak for themselves. My name is Adrian Slevin. I am with 3D Systems. I'm the dental applications engineer here. I've also been a dental technician for restorative work for about 19 years now. So I'm gonna stick around and watch the presentation with you. And after we're done, I will be here to answer any questions you might have uh, regarding the products that you've seen in this presentation. And with that, I'm going to hand the floor over to Tyler and Dr. Spagnoli. Thank you, Adrian. All right. Yeah. Slideshow from. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it's a real honor to have a chance to spend some time with you all today. You know, Tyler and I will work through things with you together, um, talk to you a little bit about the experience we've had over about two years now. I really want to say that we haven't <clears throat> finished all of the solutions yet. Uh, there was no book for us to read. Uh, we had to somewhat start from scratch and figure a lot of things out. But... Um, uh, one of our goals has been to um, increase the precision of surgery, especially in the area of full arch treatment, uh, accuracy, occlusion, vertical dimension symmetry. Um, our primary goal is our laboratory is involved in transitional prostheses. Um, uh, we're not a definitive prosthetic lab at this point. Uh, uh, and to work with New concepts, uh, we are a complete digital flow. We don't take any pressions. We don't use articulators other than virtual articulators um, uh, and use uh, additive manufacturing to develop products that we think have a lot of benefits. And that's essentially what we wanna go through with you today. So, you know, we know some of the problems. Um, if we think about the bite force um, in an edentulous patient, using a denture, that bite force is about 20% of the bite force of natural teeth. So denture acrylics and denture teeth were designed for 20% of the bite force. But if we take 
a denture or other materials, and we make them fully supported on implants, now there's no compression of the mucosa. So the bite force comes up. Unfortunately, the materials are often not suited to withstand that bite force. Also, some of the materials have increased wear, and as teeth wear and they are not as sharp, we lose masticatory efficiency. You may remember that's the term that defines that time point from when we add a bolus of food to the mouth until when it's swallowed. So sharp teeth are like a sharp knife in the kitchen. They're gonna cut and incise and masticate the food faster. Dull teeth, you have to bite harder because you can't cut the food as well. So if you have dull teeth on a prosthesis and you're biting harder, you have more potential damage to a prosthetic. Worse than that, bone doesn't know better. When you start overloading the bone, you can get negative remodeling. Remember, bone is dynamic. It constantly remodels based upon functional forces. It's internally regulated. Uh, so, so keeping the teeth sharp, uh, potentiating good masticatory efficiency is essential to long-term health of the bone, long-term health of the prosthesis. So uh, these are just some examples of things that can happen to prosthetics and things that we like to try to avoid. And the, the other concepts that we want to share with everyone today is we don't believe that with any prosthetic material, you can achieve complete solutions to all the prosthetic problems. We think that we have to re-engineer some of our thoughts so some of what we hope to share with you today are some of the concepts that we're working with and how to engineer the prosthesis to be more resistant to breakage and hold up better. So having gone through that little uh, introduction, where we're working today is in 3D printed prosthetics. So we can use the combination of a printed framework that has individual crown preps gingival anatomy and papilla anatomy in one piece. Then provide a continuous arch of printed composite resin teeth. And these are micro hybrid, highly filled resin teeth, which are very strong. They're quite abrasion resistant. Um, currently, I believe um, they're looked upon as a long-term transitional prosthet prosthetic tooth. And that's essentially how we use them. Um, you know, we continue to modify our techniques. For example, we've uh, reduced some of this embrasure form and created more of an eye beam between the teeth now than when the version that you're seeing by, you know, leaving the papillas and the sulcus, but you know, removing a little bit of this anatomy. We found that that makes the teeth a little bit stronger. But these are just little innovations. We're working. Uh, we have two of the uh, 3D systems, uh, 5100 printers. Um, they pretty much run all day, every day. Um, it's important to thoroughly blend and mix the resins for very even printing. Um, so, you know, there's always something sitting on one of the mixing boxes. And then um, uh, I'm going to let Tyler spoke, speak for a minute about the curing process, because the curing process is very important. And sometimes it's done in stages. Tell a couple of things about curing. Tyler. The curing is, is very, very important. Whenever we have like a prosthetic base come out or an arch of teeth, we immediately cure it for the total time is the goal is around 30 minutes. But right when it comes off the printer and we take the support legs off, we immediately cure it for about 10 minutes so that it holds that form and doesn't warp at all during any, any of the surgical procedures that we're doing. Dimensional stability. Dimensional so, stability. So we get some immediate dimensional stability, which by the way is very important in terms of occlusal accuracy. So, so we're able to see consistently from patient to patient to patient, extremely accurate occlusion. Um, you know, by, by facilitating that, even though as Tyler will tell you, he'll be coming back at other stages during the process to do additional curing to get exactly. to, that, to that total number. Is that right? It, it, exactly. And with the, it being a composite hybrid, we're able to use composite resin staining kits that then with the same curing unit, we're able to put the whole prosthesis in there and cure it uniformly. So we're not having to take a, a wand and do different 
sections at different times. We can do the whole thing at one time so it cures evenly throughout. So for some of you that have not worked with these materials, um, there are a number of shades available in the Crown and Bridge print resins. Uh, these are micro-filled hybrids and they are high strength and incredibly wear resistant. Uh, because of um, our COVID situation, recently we had a patient that was uh, had one of these bridges for about a year and a half. And I believe that was one of the longest that we've had out there with continuous wear. It was a patient that just due to circumstances functioned with her uh, transitional hybrid about a year and a half, a little bit over that actually, mm -hmm. closer to two years. Um, and has just recently uh, completed her prosthetics with our, with our prosthodontist. Um, but we went back and compared that prosthesis to the original design and found that in a year and a half, there was no noticeable wear. So that's a, that's a pretty good sign for a, a pretty long term. And, you know, the first, first three months of that, she was in a low functioning state during implant integration. Um, uh, we slowly bring our patients up to function, but by about five months, you know, she was functionally normally with that prosthesis. And um, so it was a, a pretty good barometer of wear. Um, there are some published um, uh, properties of the materials, especially the, we look at that flexural strength and we look at hardness and uh, uh, that flexural strength is about double what the ISO standard is. So the materials are quite strong. They take a high shine and a high polish. They're very smooth materials. I think all of you know that one of the biggest factors that leads to a reduction of wear of a, a prosthetic material is how smooth it is. So since they take such a high polish, a high shine, they're very wear resistant. And then we've been working for the last couple of years, uh, first of all, probably in a beta site and then um, you know, with the on the market materials, with the, uh, the 3D plus denture material. And that is what we're formulating and blending for our um, hybrid bases. So essentially it's a, um, it's a base material that acts as a framework, but it has gingival anatomy. It has crown preps within it that will explain why we do that for strength reasons. Um, and it has papilla. So, there's not a lot of extra laboratory time required to build up uh, an aesthetic mask, if you will. Uh, flexural strength is very good, uh, 84 millipascals. Modulus at 2383 millipascals. Um, you know, these, these are very biocompatible bio materials, um, very low solubility and extremely low water absorption, which is important. Um, this is our lab, a couple of the printers here. Um, you can see that we can print multiple bases at a time. Uh, it also gives us the opportunity to print at least a couple for each patient. Sometimes more will do that. And the, we'll go through that process in a minute. Um, but I want to go through a little bit of engineering for just a moment and uh, uh, how we look at things. So we, we look at uh, compression of the material. Um, especially we look at tension on the material because all, all too often when we build a, a hybrid prosthesis, we have to consider the fact that if there's any form of a cantilever, which we try to reduce, there will be um, a, a little bit of, um, uh, of, a, of a bending type of flexion. And so a tension band is the best way to resist that. Um, a tension band can provide a lot more strength to the material than a compression band. Um, so we look at all of those from an engineering perspective. Certainly, we can go back and re review our elastic modulus, um, uh, you know, our, our total tensile strength, and of course our, our, our fracture point uh, when we start to study these materials. And we have um, a, a number of iterations of this material in different forms that we've printed, um, being studied at a lab that I work have worked with for a long time uh, in, in New Orleans. Um, and hopefully we're gonna have some pretty good data for everyone fairly soon, but wasn't ready to release at this point. Um, but one of the things that's really relative to a hybrid prosthesis, regardless of the material you're using, and I think it's important to think about, is some 
research that was done years ago, you know, by a, a German scientist named Kirsch, pretty much um, all of the engineering literature refers back to this paper and they say, don't try to prove it. It's well proven and it's really difficult. So we just take, take the information and essentially a hole in a biomaterial is in, a, in the engineering literature is called a stress concentration. Um, in common language, we might call that a stress riser. And so anywhere there's a hole in a material based upon Kirsch's research, there is a concentration of the stress, which is a factor of three. So every time we have a screw access hole in a material, at that point, there's a significant stress concentration, which makes that area of the material more prone to failure. Interestingly enough, if that hole becomes oval, the factor, the stress factor remains the same. It's three, but it's over a bigger field because of the distortion of the material over that oval shape. So if you use um, multi-unit abutments so that they're at different angles and you have to open the holes to see the prosthesis, then you're going to have a, a bigger stress concentration within the material. We've come up with a couple of ideas on how to reduce that. So if we look at a beam, we'll call that a prosthesis, with um, some implant support underneath it and four parallel holes all the way through it, then probably the greatest risk are the distal holes if there's a, a cantilevered portion, because where there's a down force here, there's a rotational force, okay? And then if you can resist that rotational force with a strong tension band, that will do more for you than a strong compression band. Now, if you can reduce the holes by just keeping the four for retention purpose, remember in prosthetics, we have retention, but then instead of putting additional holes in the posterior or, for, or the molar area and just place rest seats, now you can have resistance form, resisting the bite force without increasing um, the stress concentration within the material. So oftentimes we'll build our cases now with adequate holes, three to four, for retention, and then add rest seats in the posterior for resistance. Thus, we have a shorter uh, cantilever or no cantilever. We have less rotational force within the prosthesis. We have good re resistance form. Other ways that will address things is sometimes if we only have four implants and we have to have angled implants in the posterior, then what will happen is we will often take um, our posterior uh, multi-unit abutment and instead of perhaps using a 17 that would come straight through the occlusal plane of a molar, we'll change that to a 30 degree so it's actually parallel to the anterior implants, thus reducing the size of the hole so it's not oval and increasing the strength of the prosthesis. So a lot of things can be done through engineering. Um, and then another iteration that we've come up with more recently, probably over the last eight months, is, is not having screw access holes that go all the way through the prosthesis. And I'm sure you're scratching your heads when I say that. But what we have found with additive manufacturing and printing is if we print well-formed crown preps in the base, and then we crown that with a continuous bridge, those are computer-derived crowns. They have tight draw. So just with a little bit of temp bond, those teeth will stay on. Then we have no screw access holes on the occlusal surface, but yet that bridge is easy to pop off if you want to access the screw holes. So that gives us the benefit of screw holes only in the base material, none on the occlusal surface. And at the end of the day, the access is much faster because these teeth can be popped off with a couple of purchase points very quickly to get to the uh, access holes for the screws, and it takes much less time than drilling composite resin out of four or more holes. So going forward, we're just going to go through a little bit about how we do things. So we tend to use a, uh, uh, a low density composite res, I mean, excuse me, a low density um, bite, sure. bite registration material, and we make sure we obtain our bite registrations with the condyle seated. 
uh, in, a, in a proper position. Um, we do use a, a, a full uh, skull type of CT scanner to, to get a, a, a good record. Um, uh, very particular about obtaining a good CT scan. Then after that, we'll um, uh, take an intraoral scan, uh, both arches. Um, of course, if we don't have teeth, we'll do a dual scan and, um, and then a, a good bite registration. Uh, from there, um, we'll transfer this information over to Tyler, who will begin to build this in ExoCAD. You want to talk about that a little bit, Tyler? And then once we have it, uh, the CT, we uh, can take in the intraoral scans and we virtual articulate every single case. And we'll take that and then we'll create the prosthetic and orient it to the CT. And this, with the workflow, the CT and the intraoral scan all being with the condyle seated, we're able to maintain that vertical really well throughout the case. So anterior and posterior facial height are maintained throughout the entire workup. So our occlusal accuracy is precise. Um, we all, I mean, other than minor little touch-ups, we don't find cases with any type of uh, open bites or, or, or things of this nature, which we, you know, we've seen consistently in the past. So having good records and, and being able to maintain everything in a virtually articulated uh, format allows us to provide accurate prosthesis. Um, uh, again, we've, we've alluded to the uh, base material and the bridge material already. We're just gonna go forward. And what we're gonna do is just jump into an example case. I know for most of you, it's late in the day, so this might be a little bit more fun. And then we're gonna go through how we built these cases. So we're just gonna run through what was a, a difficult case. It pushed us to work very hard. It also tells you how fast we can work. This was a 71 year old female and her existing bridge fractured and it was right before the holidays. Put yourself in this position. As you know, most of the churches were closed. Um, this, this lady has lung cancer on oxygen, no respiratory reserve. Her church was gonna be able to open for Christmas she just wanted to go and spend it with, with her daughters and her husband, of course. Her dentist called and said, Dan, can you do something for her? And I said, we'll have something for her. We'll, 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 have, we'll have teeth for Christmas. Uh, we cannot put this patient under general anesthesia. She had no respiratory reserve. As you can see, a very complicated medical history. So we had to do her under a sedation anesthesia. So you know, Tyler and I sat down and we planned her therapy to be provided as minimally invasive as we possibly could. So again, we obtained records and to do so, we took the bridge that she had and we just temp bonded it onto the roots, got a pretty good bite registration that way. And we built our records from there because again, we needed to do a fast turnaround. Um, from there, we did some pre pre-planning and um, uh, Tyler took the, the setup. We planned all of our implants into the marrow spaces we normally do. And then he went ahead and took it to ExoCAD and, and planned the case. Go ahead, Tyler, show him a little bit. With the ExoCAD design, we were able to, all of the, the bone anatomy you're seeing is directly from the CT. It hasn't been moved in three-dimensional space at all. So it, helps us really orient everything exactly where it needs to be. And this is pretty much our, our arch before. And then that shows our crown parts and the thimble design with the sulcus and gingiva. And this shows the bone reduction plan that will be required to provide the prosthesis on the proper occlusal plane at the proper vertical dimension. And from there, um, we developed one of what we call our precise guides with pre precise um, adaptation to basal bone anatomy. But in this particular case, we did not clip into the nasal floor like we do in some of our guides because we wanted to limit our dissection. But you can see some of the fine points, the vertical dimensions defined, the condyles are, are nicely seated. So we're in a, in a good position. 
from here, um, from here we were able to predetermine where the holes were going to come through the prosthesis eventually, and that shows that's just the transparent look through the maxillary anatomy and showing the parallel draw that we were able to obtain with the anterior implants, and then we were able to in the posterior pre-plan the draw for a 17 degree multi-unit abutment. And that'll be on the next slide. Yes. So on this slide, um, again, it shows the bone reduction plane, the development of the um, uh, framework with the gingival anatomy, crown preps, the papillas, you know, a little bit of eminence anatomy. Um, one of the things that you're beginning to see here is an interface You'll see it between our guides. Let me just go back and show that to you. You see it between our guides as well as our teeth, where we found that one of the inaccuracies in some of the stack systems that are out there are pins. So anytime you pin something, you're stuck with that pinned position. And we determined uh, that that's not so good. So we've developed a cylinder and piston system. So once we reduce the bone, uh, based upon the reduction guide. And I think you can see that back here. We have it. Well, I thought we had a good picture of that. Maybe not. So anyways, once we've reduced the bone, then um, uh, the, the implant guide goes into the, uh, into the pistons. And then finally, the teeth will fit into the pistons. So, so the thing is, is that interface has to be exact. Um, you know, there's, if you pin it, you can just squeeze it in, but it has to be exact. And then all we do is we tack that with a little bit of composite resin. Once we're done drilling, it pops right off. Then um, we can use the same um, bone reduction guide with the uh, pistons in the base. And so we just set the pistons in there, but we, we snap the teeth on and um, uh, attach the teeth. So what this diagram will show is what Tyler was mentioning, that even though the, this is an angled implant, we can plan our 17 degree um, multi-unit abutment so it is parallel to our anterior implants, thus limiting the size of the access holes in the base, keeping the material stronger with engineering principles. Um, this is what we mentioned to you about keeping uh, the, uh, the crown anatomy or the bridge had to be very strong by limiting the embrasure depths. So in real life, in this case, he went ahead and printed the maxilla, put some analogs in. This shows the printed bone reduction guide. Uh, that will be attached with screw fixation. We do not pin our guides. We always use screws. It's much more rigid, much more predictable. Um, one can see the intimate fit of the guide to the patient anatomy uh, for bone reduction so that it's precise. In the mouth, the bone reduction guides in place, the implant guide with a passive fit tacked with composite resin, guided implant placement. Implants are always placed in the marrow space, avoid pressure on cortical bone so we don't get negative remodeling down the road. This shows you the intimate fit of the guide, we call it precise guide, to the bone with the pistons for placement screw fixation. All of these little nuances make accurate surgery. And then if, you know, like many other individuals do, we just basically have a printed, uh, this is a 3D printed washer that shows uh, where the um, screws go on the multi-unit abutment so we get that very parallel abutment uh, to reduce the size of the access holes and obtain strength through printing. And then this is a printed base and printed teeth. See the interface. So when it's time to pick up the prosthesis, uh, the draw is very simple because of the parallelism. We have very parallel crown preps, which automatically gives good retention of the teeth. And we can set the teeth into the cylinders or the base into the cylinders. And then at that point, 
we'll just snap the teeth on, not loot them, just snap them on the base, set the occlusion. But what you have the ability to do is finite small adjustments of the pistons and cylinders to get that occlusion precise. And then once the base and the teeth are in precise relationship to the opposing arch, then you, excuse me, you tack it with your composite resin. At that point, you snap the teeth off and it's very easy to do the pickup because you have direct access to the cylinders. And uh, of course, at that point, we just finish them outside of the mouth. And then we can bring this back to the patient, put the base on, screw it into position, snap on the teeth. Usually we'll use a little bit of Premier um, Tempon that's for uh, implant crowns. We cut that heavily with Vaseline. We need very little cement because the retention of the teeth is so good. And then we'll take a little bit of flowable composite resin, use a pink flowable and just flow it to seal all of the interfaces. It gives a little bit more tooth retention and, and, and seals them. Um, almost no occlusal adjustment is needed usually. And you can see post-treatment, proper vertical dimension, implants are in ideal position. Uh, and we like to check and you can see all of these in, implants are right inside the marrow space, nothing that's gonna stress the cortical bone. And that treatment was one hour and 45 minutes. We recovered the patient for 30 minutes uh, and that was done under sedation anesthesia. So that's just an example of, of a very modern way of treating a patient. Uh, at at 4.5 months, we take the prosthesis off. You can see the tissue is pristine and beautiful, good keratinized tissue, nice alignment. And then at that point in time, Tyler usually will do some spiffing, uh, cleaning things up, final contouring, and, and then um, putting, in this case, a, I think it, once everything's in the computer, it doesn't cost a lot to print another set of teeth. Exactly. So, so we print a new set of teeth and snap those on for the patient. Um, very nice. You, as I mentioned before, the high polish, the high shine, you, not very much wear on the teeth. Back into position, the screw access holes are in the base only. Um, snap the teeth on, occlusion's perfect. And this patient is really quite quite happy and well treated. Um, it's one of the few times we ever see her without her nasal cannulas in. Um, so I think that's an you know some an example of how we can use some uh, composite resin and and printed three D resins to uh, provide very accurate uh, occlusion, vertical dimension, and aesthetic smile. Um, with what we call a long-term transitional prosthesis. So now we're going to go back into some of the nuts and bolts of how to do this in a couple of other cases. So, uh, you know, in terms of our analysis, we can do three, 3D facial photography together with intraoral scans, looking at our vertical dimension, again, getting our CTs at the proper vertical, some pre-planning, STL files, no impressions ever. Um, honestly, we never take an impression. Um, and we can place all of this into ExoCAD initially. And I'm going to let Tyler talk a little bit about, um, I don't see your little icon to start the video. Let's Maybe see here. Too. We can pull this down. Yeah. Here we go. There, go. there it goes. So Tyler's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the, the so workup. We take the, the CT with it seated completely and then we'll uh, make a bone model directly from that CT and get an STL file that we can work with throughout the entirety of the case so that everything's directly oriented to the CVCT. Then we'll take the intraoral scans like was shown here and they will be oriented directly to that CVCT it just goes forward. That allows us to take it into exoplan. And in exoplan, we will place the implants into a proper position, trying to, in the anterior, create that parallel draw. And in the posterior, 
with the proper angles so that whenever you put the multi-unit on it, everything draws so well and the pickup is so much easier when they're all parallel. This is just showing that parallelism. And then from that, we can create a reduction plane. And it'll show here, then we can create that reduction model with the piston system. And that shows the anterior and nasal spine. We were able to utilize it to achieve. And all of these parts are printed with the guide material. Exactly. The next end guide material. And th that right there really shows the intimate contact with the anatomy. And then the screws are in basal bone anatomy. Then the gingival prosthetic base design is oriented using the same pistons. So everything stays in the exact same three dimensional space with the proper teeth there. We kept, we kept vertical dimension the entire time, exactly the same in the posterior and the anterior. And that pretty much shows the a maxillary version. We'll show a mandibular version here in just a second. So if we look at that exact same um, patient clinically, one can see the dissection, um, elevate the nasal mucosa. This is a standard procedure for an oral surgeon. The little clips go into the nose. We follow the anterior nasal spine and intimate um, adaptation to the bone. So a very precise guide. And then using screws to the bone is much more stable than pins. One of the other advantages of this approach is we do not, do not have to strip palatal blood supply, you know, like an alveolar based guide. And um, I, I'm a little concerned about some of the stripping that goes on there because that's a very, very important blood supply to this alveolar bone. So, you know, we try to avoid that at all costs. So uh, essentially we can then reduce the bone and loot the implant guide. You know, it has a very precise relationship to the reduction guide. If it doesn't have that precise a relationship, we know we have an interference. We take it down until it's passive and exact. That way our whole plan follows the plan. Um, once the implants are in position, the uh, prosthetic uh, framework base, if you will, uh, goes to the pistons. It's just the pre-designed holes are in perfect alignment. Uh, we can then add the teeth or snap the teeth on, set the occlusion exactly how we want it. Once we've set the teeth on, we loot it. Then we can take the teeth off and do the pickup with no teeth in the way. Uh, take it to the lab and uh, final finish it and then just bring it back and screw it into position. Here's this particular patient four months post-operatively, very healthy tissue. Probably did a little bit of refinement of the contact of the tissue here, but you can see you know, nice robust uh, ridge anterior to the implants with good keratinized tissue. It's really a picture of health. And uh, yeah, she looks, you know, very good at that point. So uh, we're going to show a mandibular rendition with a, a little different twist where we use rest seats uh, for our, our posterior support and just show you another variation on the theme. So again, using our three-dimensional photography um, uh, coupled to our CT scan, uh, I'll keep, so I sound like a broken record, but getting this done correctly builds the whole case. You've got to get a good CR record with your CT scan. Your bad records, bad result. So we, we spend a lot of time, you know, and the people we work with, we teach them to do this so that they get it right. Uh, uh, take a nice um, 
scan of the, this was an existing maxillary prosthesis, the lower arch, develop that STL file, and then turn it over to uh, uh, Tyler after verifying good positions of everything for him to start to build the case. Again, we create the uh, bone model directly off of the CBCT, making sure we can even verify in another, again, on top of the CT that the condyles are seated because you can see it perfectly here. And then we take that intraoral scan. And every time we take an intraoral scan, we verify that we have them seated so that the intraoral scan matches exactly what we have in the CT. And you can see here where we line them up and get them exactly matched. And then the upper was a little bit tricky on this one because it was a, a denture, so it didn't show up on the, the CT. But based off of the mandibular, we were able to get it oriented exactly how we needed to. Then with Dr. Spagnoli, we were able to plan the implants to really a, a perfect draw in the anterior four, and we were utilized the posterior as rest seats, like you said. And that really shows the picket fence look to these. And we've even got it pretty dialed in, so dialed in that the holes, we actually have to open them up even a little bit more just so we have enough room to have the pickup material because it's the flowable, the flowable. Yeah. Sometimes the holes are so accurate that uh, the, there's no room between the temporary cylinder and the hole. So we have to just open them a little bit to get the flowable uh, uh, composite in there or the, um, um, the, the unison. unison. And then here, this is just showing in the mandibular, we need a positioning device because we don't have that nasal, nasal spine like we do in the maxilla. So we, create a splint, basically a splint that will serve as a positioning device to get that reduction piece exactly where we need it to be. Then we create the reduction virtually. And then that shows the precise fit of the guide to the reduction piece. And then using our those same latches so that everything is in the exact same spot as it was prior, we are able to create the prosthetic base and the arch of teeth to snap on. And then in this case, we even went a little bit extra just for really presentation purposes. We created a couple virtual articulators that we then printed using the model material. You'll see that here in just a second. And this shows the those crown preps really well with the deep sulcus anatomy. And in this case, we created a little bit of a posterior open bite just so they didn't really put a lot of load on those shorter implants in the posterior. That's during the low functioning state of about three months. And then uh, the nice thing is it's easy to reprint a new bridge to snap on with complete occlusion that we'll put in around four months. Mm -hmm. And this is gonna show our little articulator piece that we created. So that's a printed articulator. Which material do you use for that? The that was using the gray next dent model material 2.0. <clears throat> very, very sturdy material. And we'll go on to show it in a clinical aspect. Right. So again, what one can see is what we planned in the lab, we're able to uh, execute clinically. So this is the printed 3D articulator that you just saw. 
Um, uh, again, for us, it's a chance for us to do some validation of the work and, and cross check it before we do it in the patient. Um, so this is the maxilla, it's articulated to the uh, definitive prosthesis here, which has an orientation through the pistons and cylinders to the reduction guide, which shows a, a screw fixation of, of the guide in the bone reduction. So all of the principles, so we have the right occlusal plane, the right vertical dimension, the proper occlusal anatomy. This is the printed um, base, if you will, or, or framework. Crown anatomy, all of the details are here. And this is the bridge from a couple of different viewpoints. Uh, the reduction uh, guide has a, uh, a printed uh, index from the existing teeth. Sometimes we have to take a couple of teeth out for screws. Well, we can do that ahead of time. Uh, if there's a situation where there are no teeth to index from, we can make an index to stable alveolar bone anatomy. In other words, mature alveolar ridge can be used as an index. And that's just a little different index, but this shows how all of this articulates and comes together. The actual implant guide for the four retentive implants and the two rest implants. So our dissection is completed. Again, we don't have to do any excessive lingual stripping, just a little bit. And um, the index is placed the uh, reduction guide is placed and rigid screw fixation. So once we place it, it doesn't move. We can uh, rely on it. The actual intimate fit of this reduction guide to the bone is observed here with rigid fixation. It makes it very easy for us to reduce that bone very precisely. If we have a little uh, prematurity here, we'll, we'll find it quickly. We'll reduce it until the implant guide passively sits on the surface. So we know we have ultimate accuracy and we get what we planned. We sit this into position, we loot it, and then we go ahead and do our implant placement. When it's time to place the base, as you can see, the pre-designed access holes are exact. As Tyler mentioned, sometimes we actually have to drill them out a little bit so we can um, place enough unison for the attachment. It's a very precise fitting. Here one can see um, um, our temporary cylinders are in place. Um, our, our reduction guide, of course, is still here. And the teeth are now snapped on. The occlusion is set. Uh, once we have everything set exactly how we like it with any minor adjustments of the pistons, then the pistons are looted into position. Once they're looted, the teeth are snapped off and the attachment occurs. Uh, to just the base. And I think one can see, um, you know, we have direct access to the cylinders for uh, doing the pickup once this is all stabilized. It makes it extremely simple. You don't have to shoot resin through tiny little holes and dentures and all that other stuff that goes on out there. This is direct visualization. It's very simple. At that point, of course, we're closing the case while Tyler is doing some fine finishing. Um, as you can see here, there are fittings for the little um, uh, ball uh, prosthetics that go onto the posterior implants. So we get a little bit of retention from these, but they're primarily rest seats. But this way, there's no hole in, you know, in this posterior part of the prosthesis, which makes it stronger. Uh, and of course, there's no significant um, um, cantilever as well. You know, in today's day and age, with some of the high quality short implants available, um, most patients have enough bone for a short implant at the posterior, most. So this is a nice look at, uh, at, at a prosthesis with some pretty good gingival anatomy, good papilla anatomy, eminence form. As you can see, the teeth really are very nice looking and, uh, you know, compared to a, a denture tooth like he has on top. So here's your... Um, uh, tapered short implants in the posterior with a ball attachment that fits into the, the receptacle. And then of course, we have four very parallel temporary cylinders to hold that prosthesis. One can get an image of the ball attachments versus the cylinders, take a look at all of that here. And then um, you know, this is a, about a six week post-op uh, visit and the tissues all healed and the occlusions very good. 
So um, I think uh, that uh, gave us a chance to introduce some of the concepts we're working with using our additive manufacturing, our printed resins and both the, the, the pink framework and base with uh, included papilla form, gingival form, eminence form, uh, you know, as well as, uh, you know, the printed complete bridge. One of the thing the one of the advantages of doing the complete bridge versus individual teeth like are done in some prosthetics is when those teeth are bridged together on those crown preps, it forms a tension band. That tension band resists flexion in the material. So not only do we have a strong material, but we have mechanical engineering that improves the strength of the prosthetics. So a lot of things going on here. We're not done yet. We have some new things we're doing, um, uh, but uh, you know, some material testing going forward and hopefully over the next year or so, we'll be able to share even more with you all. But um, we'd like to take some questions. Uh, if there's any qu questions that you have for us and um, uh, we're certainly uh, open to coaching as well. If anybody has any strong recommendations, because we're the first ones to tell you there is no book on this and we don't know it all. Here's one question. Okay. So there's a question here to reduce breakage. Can you print a layered support base with metal on the lower layer of the full arch and mechanically cement the aesthetic zirconia layer on top? Excellent question and something we're working on. Interestingly enough, 3D Systems has another division, and, and Adrian can address this, where they do 3D printed frameworks, and they're incredibly accurate. And they can be printed with some surface enhancements that improve the bonding interface between the, the resin and the metal, much different than putting an aesthetic mask on a, on a metal prosthesis. So I like this question because we've already begun to look at building our prosthetic base with, in the computer, we can do a cutout on the inferior surface to accept that printed metal framework, which will inlay into it and then can be completely covered with composite resin, go back to the light box and make that sealed within there. Now there won't be any um, resin to flake off over the years because it's a solid piece. With regards to the teeth, right now these are micro hybrid printed teeth. Um, we, we have some early information that this composite resin base will allow one to bond um, Emacs, uh, lithium desilicate bridges, because uh, lithium desilicate will bond quite nicely to the composite resin, unlike zirconium. So, so those are all things under development right now. I love the question. Um, as we learn more, we'll share. And of course, um, you know, if you have some other knowledge and you want to contact us and share some things with us, we're we're always, um, you know, looking forward to learning from others as well. Great question. Any other questions? Do you guys regularly polish or do you add composite on all of the cases? Could you say that again? Yeah, do you regularly add composite to give it a characterization um, on every oh. case or do you just polish them uh, at times? How do you decide? In, in so, do, so usually on the you know, day of surgery, if the patient's been under general anesthesia, a lot of times we'll just snap that set of teeth on, you know, just as we've printed them uh, and then come back after a couple of months, once everything's stabilized and do some enhancements to the teeth with, you know, staining and, and, and things of this nature. Um, you know, that's most of the time the patients are very happy with the appearance of the teeth, you know, in the temporary stage. Uh, it's not hard to do the staining, but it takes a little bit longer. And we try to not keep our patient under anesthesia any longer than possible. Certainly, um, it's possible to stain the same day that you place if, if you'd like to, or you can pre-stain the teeth as well if you know exactly what you want to do. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we may have missed this. However, we're wondering if you um, cement the temp cylinders to the denture material and what temp material or what cement do you use? So we use the uh, um, uh, uh, 3M ESPE Relyx Ultimate as our um, resin to attach the cylinders to the base. Um, it's extremely effective. Um, I don't think we've delaminated any of them. Have we ever? No, no. We've, never, we've never had one delaminate. Um, so it's, it's an extremely reliable material. It has a very fine tip, which makes it very easy to de deliver it into that space. And the really nice thing is we, after doing the pickup in the mouth and doing the hand-like cure, we then bring it up to the our 3D systems print box and we are able to do a really monolithic cure of that so that it's cured completely all the way through and it just, it, the light box with the 12 lights in it really penetrates better than a hand light ever will, so. You have another question here. Does the resin allow absorption of acids that could produce mouth odors? The resin um, has an extremely low absorptive uh, coefficient that is published. Um, we have not had any issues with that. Uh, we do put a very high polish uh, on this before we deliver it to the patient. And we often, and we do, you know, do a surface seal with Pallia seal. Mm -hmm. um, but the resin is very, very, very dense, takes a high polish, and it has a very, very low absorptive coefficient. Um, so we haven't seen an issue with that. Yeah, and a little bit of a side answer here, or question is, um, do you find that your 3D printed parts stain more easily than other parts? And do you recommend any particular type of care after the visit? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, our hygiene protocol is that we ask our patients to use a non-abrasive toothpaste. So we don't create a lot of micro scratches. Um, you know, our patients, you know, brush, they water pick, and then they use an air flosser. And we do use chlorhexidine in the air flosser on every patient. Um, now, as soon as they air floss, we have them spit the excess out. So even in that situation, we've only had two patients out of you know, lots and lots, like don't know the exact number, um, where we saw some staining. Um, one was a, a prolific author who drinks tea all day. But just by doing a couple of changes with her, we were able to get almost all this, get her to where she was in staining. Um, uh, so staining is not a major issue, but you do have to sometimes work with the patient to say, you know, let's brush your teeth, you know, if, after you drink a cup of tea or something like that uh, to, to help keep it down. Uh, but we haven't had very, very many issues with stainings. And if staining does occur, it's extremely easy to clean it off. Thank you. Now we are out of time. But I wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Thank you so much, Dr. Spagnoli and Tyler, for doing this. this is super interesting workflow. And I'm hoping that we can come back again and learn more from you guys. Um, now, I'm going to share our emails here on the screen. So if anybody has any further questions or follow up, um, I'll let you know that the printer um, seems like it would be an extremely expensive printer, but it's actually not. You can get the entire package for $14,000. So. Um, so we have, we're able to give you um, 26 materials and very high accuracy as you've seen on these slides here. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Here is our email and we will pass any questions that you email us with um, to Dr. Spagnoli if they're technical questions about his presentation. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure.